I think everyone heard what is an electromagnetic wave because our whole life is established on electromagnetic waves. We listen, we talk, we watch in our mobiles. They are all electromagnetic waves. They inform us from a distance. We talk with our friends, relatives, but more than that, we get information from other planets, other heavenly objects, and from sun we have our Earth is washed by electromagnetic radiations at any moment. So, in other words, electromagnetic waves bring us information from elsewhere, from other heavenly objects. They are good friends of us, electromagnetic waves. But they cannot bring us any kind of information. So we are searching for more uh, basic ingredients that can bring us information that the electromagnetic base cannot. What are these? These agents are simply the gravitational waves. Because gravitational wave is the wave of a universal force. What does it mean? Gravitational force is a universal force because it exists in every kind of interaction. But electromagnetic wave is not. Only it exists between charged objects. So, how about if there are no charges? That means we are deaf against that interaction. But if any object has an energy or a mass, definitely it is accompanied by gravitational wave. So, Learning about gravitational waves started from 1920s. So in our records, the first uh, study was given by Brinkman. Brinkman, 1923. So this he, he was a mathematician after discovery of uh, Einstein's theory and other things. This man wrote down the first mathematical metric that represents gravitational waves. So even today, when we are working with gravitational or other kind of waves, we come across with this way <coughs> of Brinkman. So there is a standard form that it is called Brinkman form. But that is not the only form. Later on, in 1930s, 40s, I should put another name, Rosen. Rosen, 1930s and 40s. So these, what these people gave, they gave mathematical form of a representation of waves, electromagnetic, gravitational, because those two forces were the only known forces by that time. Uh, always, when we want to introduce the physics of gravitational waves, it is very complicated, so we prefer to start with electromagnetic waves. Because, more or less, everyone has some idea about electromagnetic waves. And then, by analogy, we try to understand electromagnetic waves. You will remember 
<coughs> electromagnetic waves were as detected in 1887 by Hertz. 1887. In books you may see that Hertz. E electromagnetic waves. Now, the problem that we face today is how about gravitational waves? Have they been detected? Now, surprisingly, during the last few days, there are rumors that they have discovered gravitational waves. Ah, what experiment they did? Of course, things are not as simple as the detection of electromagnetic waves, because this was just, it was a very simple technology at the beginning of that electronic age. So uh, transmission of electromagnetic waves and then the waves of Marconi detection, discovery of radio and so on. So that, that came in the following years. So now we are facing a parallel incidence that the gravitational waves has been claimed during the few, last few days. So they say that if this is true, this may be the discovery of last maybe 100 years. Because for 100 years, they have been expecting for gravitational waves. We have all the theories, all the mathematical formalisms, so much books, thousands of articles, this, that, but where are they? No one could detect it so far. So the announcement during the last three days was very, very important. So therefore, it brought me to go back to my old Bakkal Defteri to search for my work that I did 1988, 1990, I had published two papers, and uh, I think just in that year I became a professor, in fact, because I had published some number of papers in this field. So writing papers by that time required some uh, talent, but today it is not so because of the electronic age, everyone can write a paper, but by that time, uh, I, you can believe me that it was not so easy. So, now, as I said, we have to know something about electromagnetic waves. I can write a simple formula down uh, to represent the, what is an electromagnetic wave, but from our experiences, when you go to the sea shore, the seaside, and you suppose you are looking at the sea surface of sea, there are ripples on the sea. And you notice that the uh, small ripples, due to the reflection of the sunshines from those ripples, they, it glares your eyes. So you do not see those glares continuously. But each time that the water wave comes to an angle, then you feel that uh, that glaring you feel, so you cannot look at it. That is why we are using glasses, sunglasses. Because sunglass is it contains a polarizer so that it gauges out that, that kind of glaring that you cannot look somewhere because of sunshine shining. So to uh, remove those glare events, you use sunglasses. What is a sunglass? It is a polarizer. Sunshine is 
not polarized. The sunshine that we are getting from the sun do not have definite polarization. So it is mixed, like water waves. Maybe water waves, we can do simple experiment. You know, suppose this is a water wave. If you put a piece of wood that flows, the wave is moving. So what do you see? When the wave comes, this wooden block goes up and moves to, your, to the right. So that means the water waves have two words. Both transverse effect and longitudinal effect. Because the wood both goes this way <coughs> and up down. So up down, we call it the transverse property of the water wave. And the other one that moves the object along the direction of motion, that is the longitudinal wave. So water waves has mixed character. Now the sunshine that also comes from sun have uh, mixed uh, polarization. It has transverse and other components, but then you use a polarizer, then what comes out, depending on the direction of the uh, polarizer, it comes out with certain angles, certain intensity. So there are some laws, like Manus law. So if you have a calcium mineral, so Sunshine is coming, let us say, here, without a uh, well-defined direction. Then it goes like this, like this. So, so maybe this is polarized in this way, this is polarized this way. So we call this event birefringence. Birefringence, this calcium mineral. Uh, that means when light moves in it, it does not move equal velocity in different directions. So it has this property. But for glass, for example, which is amorphous, it has a, in all directions, it has same speed. And you can talk about the refraction index for a glass. So now, when you watch the ripples of water from the surface of the sea, at certain angles you see the glaring. So that angle, it has a particular value. It is exactly the angle that polarizes it in your eyes. Okay, so you know this in the book it is called the Brewster angle. And for water and sunshine, it has 53 degrees. That means when the angle, so suppose this is the surface of the water, so light comes, you are here, so this is the normal, and then reflection comes to your eyes, so this is 53 degrees. Then you see the glaring. But if you move up, down a little bit, of course, from the same point you do not see, but different point because ripples are continuous. <coughs> so, therefore, this is called the polarization by reflection. It is a very simple, natural process. So, we have, we know, in fact, a lot about the electro magnetic waves, we have a huge experience. So we want to carry this experience to gravitational waves. Okay. So for example, in gravitational waves, we don't know yet what is a Brewster angle. At which angle, if there is gravitational wave, 
uh, it will be detected and, or it will not be detected. So the polarization problem of gravitational waves, as I said, is rather complicated, so to say. So to say a few words, gravitation is described by the curvature of the space, which is called Riemann curvature. Riemann curvature. So this is a fourth run tensor, I, J, K, L. So this Riemann tensor, it is split into a Y tensor plus other parts. I will not specify them. So I think those who took some course in advanced mathematics, they know more or less what is a Riemann tensor. It is a four-track tensor. It has certain symmetric properties. But this Riemann tensor is split into this one, we call it Weyl tensor. Weyl tensor. And the others, so in four dimension, this one has 20 components. 20 components. This Y has 10, and this one has another 10. So this is how they split the Riemann tensor. Ah. If we are talking about gravitational waves, forget about the others, because the others relate to the source. We do not want source. We want only free gravitational waves, like free electromagnetic waves. You know, this picture is well known about the uh, electromagnetic waves. So there are vibrations, vibrations. So this is a plane polarized electromagnetic wave that propagates, let us say, in Z direction. And the oscillations are in the X and Y directions. So this is what we mean by uh, a polarized electromagnetic wave. In fact, it is, we call it a linearly polarized electromagnetic wave unless we make some extra additions so that this plane may rotate. So in a medium, for example, we don't have this simple picture, but there are some kind of rotations, and the magnitudes, amplitudes of the waves also uh, get less, becomes less if it is moving in a medium, and so on. So now, similar to this picture, if we want to talk about gravitational waves, we'll concentrate on the wide curvature, this part, because it represents pure gravitational waves. So the name of Y, so we can formulate these 10 parameters by five complex functions. So, I can call them psi 0, psi 1, <coughs> psi 2, psi 3, psi 4. So these are five complex functions that characterize the gravitational wave. So of course, always you have to start with the simplest possible case, going from the very beginning to the very complicated case, you cannot get out. So, therefore, the, each one of these components has some physical meaning. This one, Psi 2, represents mass and angular momentum. So, the famous Schwarzschild solution that was solved in 1916 was exactly the case corresponding to psi 2. It was real, but to add its angular momentum, it took a long time. In 1963, by Roy Kerr, discovered psi 2 as a complex <coughs> function. 
So that complex part represents an 